Good morning and welcome to worship. My name is Bob Heisman, and we're so glad that you've begun your week here together with God's people. And I welcome you who are gathered here in the sanctuary. Our friends are also gathered on the north end of the campus in the Ark, but they have live music going on there this morning. They do that once a month or every other week, and so they're not hearing us today. But we're glad that uh, over our fellowship time, we'll be able to gather together in the fellowship room. And also welcome to you who are joining us online today or throughout this week. We are so glad that you have turned your heart to God this morning, and we pray that he will bless you and keep you in his care. Um, if you're able, would you stand this morning for our call to worship? It comes from John chapter 7. <clears throat> On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this, he meant the Spirit. We sing our praises to God this morning, asking for him to come, the fount of living waters. May he come to you today. Let's worship him together. Better to have a Bible that's well-worn than one that's not used at all. 
As we know, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He came for sinners and to die for our sins, but so much more than that. Um, found these words in Matthew chapter 10, which may be familiar. Jesus calls the, the 12 disciples, and it says here, Don't go among the Gentiles or among the Samaritans. Rather, go to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. So Jesus didn't just come to forgive our sins. He came to heal our brokenness. And today as we sing, our chains are gone. Celebrate that with us this morning. this morning we come to you because 
you have revealed yourself to be a God of mercy, a Savior of sinners. So, Lord, today lift up the light of your countenance upon us, for we are in darkness. Give your strength to us, for we are weak. Love us not because we can repay you, but because you know how to love the unworthy and the unlovely. Make us be more like you so we can show mercy and kindness to those we love and to those who no one loves. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Take a few moments and greet and welcome one another this morning, and then you may be seated. We give God thanks this morning as we worship him with our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. If you brought a gift today on the first day of the week, um, we are thankful for it. And it was received for our general fund, which uh, covers our um, general ministries, our staff, and our campus, um, and our um, local ministry, and also our benevolent fund. Um, gifts for the benevolent fund um, are used by our deacons for people who find themselves in a time of crisis, both from our church and in our community. So thank you for your gifts today, and they'll be received at this time. <laughs>
boys and girls who are heading to Just Be Tweens or Children's Worship, um, after we pray, we're going to send you right directly there. So look for the banner and your helper in the back. If you're going for the very first time, um, please bring a family member with you so they know where to pick you up um, at the conclusion of our time of worship. But before you go, um, let us pray together um, for our um, children and with them this morning. Lord, as we go to worship you, may your spirit go with us too. Help us listen, pray, and sing that praise to your great name we bring. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, boys and girls, head for the banner in the back and uh, follow your helper um, to your classrooms this morning. Um, at this time, we welcome Ron Rodenhouse to share a few words about um, the Florida mission trip team that took place um, this winter. They went with some members of Heritage and another church, and Ron's going to give us an update about what God was doing on that trip. And you got your clicker there, Ron, too, or are they helping you in the back? All right, you're all set. <laughs> there we go. Um, Jesus told us in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. And he also said, so let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So on that note, there were 22 of us, seven from Heritage, and we went with um, Zuckman Christian Reformed Church um, down to Panama City Beach to give hope to those of who have suffered in the hurricane in 2018, Hurricane Michael. So they've been waiting three years, some of these people, to get back into their houses, or they're living in their house that is still not finished. So we went down there to give them hope. Uh, there were seven from Heritage. It was Cal Bouquet, Tom Byers, Bill Vandermeulen, Paul Burgess, and Mark Koistra. My wife and I went down there as well. We stayed in Panama City Beach at a great accommodation. It was uh, right across the street from the Gulf. Um, it was a Christian retreat that we had gotten there. Um, we had great food. Um, my sister was the cook, and uh, she loves doing that. That's her mission. That's how we got tied in with Zutphen Christian Reformed Church. Um, we had great devotions. Every morning we started with singing, had devotions, ate, and then we finished the day with singing again. So it was great. Um, let's see, what else? The people that we work for, oh, I should know first. On this picture, there's two things that we want to know. First of all, see the women in the front row? That's proof that we like women to go on these trips because they were invaluable. They worked hard. Um, some of them didn't have skills, but they still worked hard, and we got the job done. Another thing is on the picture, um, Cal Cat and Bill Vandermeulen. This is going to be the last time you're going to see them because I don't have any pictures of the jobs that they worked on. But they were there working. Uh, this was a house Tom Byers and I uh, worked on, and it was typical hurricane um, destruction, the roof came off, everything inside got wet. They redid the total inside and then ran out of funds to finish it. Um, the siding came off in certain spots, so we had to take good siding, put it on the front, and take what was left over and fix it up around the house. Um, this is where Zach and his wife lived. They were Christians, they were believers, and eager to share that they were um, great people to work for. Um, their story, I said, did, did you stay through the whole hurricane? He says, yeah, this was, a, this was a Category 3 hurricane, and we didn't think it was bad enough to leave, but it turned into a Category 5, so they stayed through it. There's a, just a before and after shot. Next, there was a group of nine that went to work for Mr. Kitt. 
Mr. Kitt was kind of a unique individual. He was a collector of sorts, as you can see in his front yard. Um, had a lot of things, but very unique individual. There's a picture of Mr. Kitt. Um, 84 years old. He shingled his own house when it was done. And uh, just kind of a unique individual. Uh, more pictures of when we started. We had to gut his whole entire inside of the house because it was in such bad repair. Uh, this was the bathroom he was using for the last three years. Inside where we had gutted the ceiling and you can see all the trash and rubble on the floor. That all had to be brought out to a dumpster. We filled two dumpsters. I didn't fill it because it wasn't my job, but the women did. Um, did a, but keep your, remember this picture here because there's a final shot of it being done. There's the pile of rubbish that had to go into the dumpster. More rubbish. Picture of Paul. Mark Koyster bringing trash out to the dumpster. Another one. Another picture of Paul. But these rooms just were terrible. They had to come out. One of the young boys that was working got a nail in his foot, so we had to do a little surgery there. Here's where we're putting the floors back in, rebuilding them. Another man working. Mr. Kitt, he was just on top of us, making sure we were doing things right, even though he didn't really have a clue as to what we were doing. Uh, another picture of us tearing it out. More tearing it out. Mr. Kitt sat down with my wife and she had a conversation with him that he said, he looked at her and he says, you know, so happy to have you down here. He says, we've been promised and promised for three years that somebody was going to come in and help us out, and nobody ever came, and then God sent you, and you still get emotional about what happened and what he said there, that was, that was just a unique thing. There's an after picture, we didn't get that far with it, but other teams came in after us and finished, and it was only six or seven weeks from when we demolished it to when it came to this, so... Um, amazing. Made him a good place to live. This is the sunrise on the beach in the morning. Oh, that was my last picture. But we had another job that I got to tell you about. This is the one that uh, Cal and Bill worked on. The same thing happened. We had to put all the drywall back up in all the ceilings because it all came down when the roof came off. And so they put the drywall up, mudded it, and uh, painted the rooms, painted the ceilings. Interesting story. There's another place where we can see God at work when we ask for, um, to direct us to the people that really needed it and that um, really needed to, to have some hope. We'd gone to church Sunday, Gulf Beach Baptist, no relation to the Bedside Baptist, uh, but there we met, we were greeted by a man, and we didn't know what was going to happen with this greeting, but uh, the first day when, we, when the guys started working at his house, there was a fellow that pulled up in a car, and he walked out, and he started looking around. He said to my brother-in-law, he says, I think I've seen you before. My brother-in-law says, I think I've seen you before. I think you greeted me in church yesterday. He says, yeah, I did. I says, well, what brings you to this job? How do you know these people? He says, James, the owner, is a new Christian, and he joined our church, and I'm his mentor. And we were talking about 
how we were going to get this place fixed up. And you guys came and answered the call. He says, thanks so much for that. That's going to give him a lot of hope. So thanks for your prayers. We got down there safely, came back safely. Uh, no one got COVID while we were down there. That was an answer to prayer. Um, I guess that's about it. That's about my four minutes. So thank you. Let's go to God in prayer this morning. Father God, this morning we praise you for who you are. We praise you for your love and for your grace, for your kindness and your compassion, for your justice and your righteousness. God, you reign as king, and we ask that you would reign in each of our hearts. Our hearts wander, and our worship is often misplaced. Forgive us for thinking that we know better than you, or that we could somehow earn your favor. Forgive us for the many times we let things of this world take your rightful place on the throne. Remind us daily of your gift of grace and turn our hearts toward you. We thank you for the many good gifts you give, for each new morning, for afternoon sunshine and birds chirping and rain that waters the earth, all reminders that you are the maker and the sustainer of life. We thank you for family and friends, for food and laughter and joy and celebration. We thank you for people who sit with us in crisis and who pray with us through tears. God, we pray that you would, re would unite your people, strengthen our congregation, and use us to make your name known here in Byron Center, in our homes and in our workplaces, and in all the in-between places you have us each day. Strengthen and unite your church universal. Encourage our brothers and sisters around the globe who are serving you in hard places. We, pr <clears throat> we pray for your hand of healing in the Ukraine. You know our desire for peace and protection, and we ask for wisdom for those making hard decisions. We lift up the needs of our congregation, for those fighting cancer, for those undergoing surgery, anticipating surgery, or recovering from surgery, for those experiencing physical pain each day, and for those who face emotional pain and heartache. We ask for your comfort and presence with our brothers and sisters who are grieving, and for strength for those who are weak. We pray for wisdom and peace for those facing decisions and for the many aches and needs and longings of our hearts that so often go unsaid. May your will be done in our lives. Thank you for being the God who sees and the God who hears. May you alone receive the praise and the honor and the glory in our hearts and lives this week. In your name we pray. Amen.
This morning we're going to read from John 18, 12 through 27. I'll give you a moment to find it in your Bible. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Cepheus, the high priest that year. Cepheus was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back spoke to the servant girl on duty there and brought Peter in. You aren't one of the man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold and the servants and other officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him on the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Cepheus, the high priest. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of the disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. John 18, 12 through 27. Thank you, Carol, for the word of the Lord this morning. We are in the season of Lent, and Lent is an old English Saxon word that simply means springtime, but it's in the springtime of the year that we are heading toward Easter, and the church has taken time, 40 days, to prepare for the celebration when God changed the world that we know as Easter. Um, in that process, we journey with Jesus um, toward his arrest and then the cross and the tomb, and we are on that journey right now. Along the way, some of our goals are that in this season of Lent, that we could increase our communication with God and our closeness with him. And people do that in a lot of different ways. Sometimes you change a habit or pattern. Um, we have been offering um, God's invitation through a book called The Invitation um, to invite you to spend time in his word and to do that um, every day for 30 days as part of um, the period of Lent. And so if you haven't done that and you'd like to join, you can do that today. It is really a four-step process. There's a scripture verse for each day. And um, we stop, we look, we listen, and we respond to it. And in the insert in your bulletin today for your sermon notes, all the scriptures for this week are listed on the bottom. So you could start um, tomorrow morning and jump right in. Stop, look, listen, and respond. In that light, um, in the month of March, for four Sundays, we're using stop, look, listen, and respond as our framework, just so that we can 
learn it together as a tool that anytime you go to the scriptures and you just want to spend some time with God, you want to um, lean into his word and listen to him, um, this is a pattern that uh, many have found helpful. Stop, look, listen, and respond. Today we're thinking about these words from John 18, um, 26 and 27 that you just heard. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, that is Peter. He said, didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, a rooster began to crow. Jesus had told Peter that you will deny me um, three times before the cock crows. And that was a way to tell time. Um, uh, roosters usually um, could be known to, to crow pretty close to the same time, um, 11.30 p.m., 1.30 a.m., 3 a.m., and at sunrise. And so when Jesus said that, he was referring to a time of day, most likely the 3 a.m. time. So this is middle of the night, and suddenly the rooster crows, and Peter realizes that what Jesus said would happen was happening, had happened. Peter had said to Jesus, I will die before I deny you. I'll go with you to your death. There's no way that what you said is going to happen. But there he was. It had happened, denying his Savior three times. In the Gospel of John, we just hear this sort of ominous, at that moment, a rooster began to crow, and it just sits there. In the other Gospels, all four of them contain um, this account in Jesus' life, in the Gospel of Luke, it says, um, the rooster crowed and Jesus looked at Peter. So they were in such a place that they could make eye contact. You can imagine what that must have felt like. The Gospel of Matthew says, when that happened, Peter wept bitterly. And the Gospel of Luke adds this detail that he broke down and wept. We want to stop today, and as we approach this scripture, this account in Jesus' life just after his arrest, this sort of grand jury trial um, before um, Annas, and then Peter's denial, we want to stop um, in the pattern of the invitation and say, um, Lord, where is my heart today as I approach this scripture? And sometimes the scripture calls us to consider the condition of our heart um, in light of the Scripture. And so today, um, we have the hard task of thinking about this Scripture and where our heart is um, as we think about regrets. Because I imagine this must have been a big regret in Peter's life. Peter was Jesus' lead disciple. He was in the inner circle of three of the greater group of 12. And he's always seen as the one out in front. Um, and so I'd like you to think about regrets today because as we look at Peter, we want to imagine his regrets and what they must have been like in this moment. My guess is it's not hard for you to remember some things that you regret. Um, some things are just sort of simple. When I look back on my life and I go all the way back to my childhood, I regret that my parents gave in so easily to my um, request not to have to take piano lessons like all of my other siblings did. Um, I was the youngest, and somehow I persuaded them that uh, I didn't need piano lessons. Uh, at the time, it looked like a big win. Looking back, I'm like, oh, I regret that uh, mom and dad gave in to that. Dad probably didn't want to write any more checks, and, uh, or they didn't want to drive me back and forth, whatever it was. You know, I was the last kid. Um, and they just said, okay, you don't have to do that. Um, now I wish I would have. Those are simple little kinds of regrets. Maybe you have some like that. Maybe you have regrets like me when you remember being in middle school and someone was being criticized or mocked and you didn't say anything and you could have. I regret that. I regret when I said something. Nobody said anything to me either. Those are regrets. As you go deeper, you can find all kinds of regrets, right? Every act of foolishness in our lives, when we look back, we usually regret them. Haven't met anyone who has the desire of their heart to be fools, 
But we do foolish things, and we regret them. Sometimes we do hurtful things. We regret those too. Well, if that's you today, biblically speaking, you're in good company, <laughs> at least with the heroes of the faith. Um, Moses, David, Peter, all with lots of regrets. Uh, Moses must have regretted his response to God and his people that kept him out of the promised land. You know, Moses, you're going to die in the desert and never make it into the promised land. David, great regrets over uh, responding to his desires with regard to Bathsheba, another man's wife, and all the complications in his life and others and all the pain he caused. Peter here, um, Jesus' chief disciple, the one who says, I will die before I deny you, and then not just once, but twice, three times. The apostle Paul, before his conversion, imagine there were lots of regrets when you stood there and condemned someone who was a follower of Jesus. We know about regrets. We all have them. When the scriptures include them, they give the Bible what some have called the criterion of embarrassment. Now imagine if you have to wonder, is the Bible true or is it just a collection of stories that someone made up? If it was just a collection of stories that someone made up, don't you think those who were writing about themselves or their friends would paint them in a more positive light than this? If you were going to leave something out, you'd probably leave out Peter's denial. His first one, his second one, and his third one. You'd probably leave that all out. John was Peter's friend. He's writing this down. He would have just left that out. But it's all included. And it meets what you know, researchers say is the criterion of embarrassment. It sort of gives one more affirmation that these things really happened to real people in real time long ago. Regrets. We know them. The um, people of ancient times, they knew them. And the people of the future, they will know them as well. What do we do with that? When we come to God and we say, God says, you say, Lord, where is my heart today? And it doesn't take long to say, whew, kind of overwhelmed with regrets. It doesn't take long to start listing them off. There they are. Some of you might have regrets from yesterday, Right? That recent, last night, you regret. And, but you're here in church on Sunday. You're in the right spot. People with regrets, we are together before God. And we turn to him for some good news. So let's look at this word. Um, we stop and we say, well, where's my heart today, Lord? We look and we ask, Lord, help me discover truth from your word today. Well, one of the truths is that anyone who brings the good news of Jesus, the good news of the gospel to the world, when we look at people in the scriptures and we look at ourselves, we realize that every person who does that is a fallible human being. Everyone has regrets. Everyone has brokenness. Everyone has troubles. I'm doing a funeral tomorrow for an old friend um, of uh, our family and our former church. And when I met with the family this week, they said, um, our dad was a good man, but he was not a perfect man. We don't want you to talk about him like he was a perfect man because you wouldn't be talking about our dad. He was human and he was fallible. There are these good things that we can laugh about and rejoice, but he was a human. And if, by definition, broken, fallible before God. Remarkably, God uses humans, broken and fallible before him, to be his plan A to share his good news with the world that he saves humans who are broken and fallible and makes them whole again in Jesus Christ. Those who otherwise would be condemned to death and eternal separation from God, he saves them and rescues them and sets them on a path to spend eternity with him where all things will be made right and all humans will be made whole. That's the good news that we have to look forward to. And so we look into God's Word. I'd like you to wonder with me just for a minute um, about Peter and Judas. Peter was Jesus' chief disciple. He denies him as it's recorded here three times when they say, hey, weren't you, weren't you with that guy, Jesus, who was just arrested? And he says, no. And they ask him the same thing again. No, nope, not me. I hope you got the wrong guy three times. 
it was just prior to the arrest, if you turn back some pages in John, that you see Judas, and he's more well-known in terms of um, betrayal than Peter. But I wonder, do you think betrayal is worse than denial, or denial is worse than betrayal? It'll just help us to dig in a little bit on these thoughts. When you're betraying someone, it seems like you're looking to get something. And so you're willing for harm to come to them so that you would have gain. It seems to me when you're denying someone, you're looking to protect yourself. You're looking to protect yourself, not gain something for yourself. Either way, it always hurts. You know, if you applied for a credit card and you were denied, you'd be like, huh, you know, I think I deserve this. If you're watching the March Madness basketball tournament and you see someone drive the lane and uh, the big man blocks their shot, you say they were denied the basket. Uh, you're like, oh, I wish that I was better, but I got denied. Um, but it's a whole different thing if you have a friend or you're in a relationship and someone would deny knowing you. Imagine if someone said, well, aren't you friends with? And you'd say, no, I'm not. We're not friends. That's Peter's denial. But Judas' betrayal? He's looking to gain something, either for himself or for the world. We're not always sure with Judas what his motivation was. He certainly didn't agree with Jesus' plan to rescue the world by dying on a cross. That didn't seem to make any sense to him at all. But denial and betrayal... We don't really have to figure out which is worse. We just have to know that this is Jesus' path to the cross. And we want to walk with Jesus and recognize his pain and suffering because it was for us. It was for us. But denial or betrayal, they're both serious business. Listen to these words from Matthew chapter 10, where Jesus says, Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. This is a verse from Scripture that often is one that calls us up to be able to stand up publicly and say, I'm a follower of Christ. He calls me to acknowledge him because he will acknowledge me before the Father. That one day, um, you know, if, you, if, there, if there are any pearly gates, you know, but figuratively speaking, if you're, you're at the pearly gates, Jesus says, come on in. This one belongs to me. I died in their place, and they trusted me. They followed me. They believed in me. They belonged to me, body and soul and life and in death. They're mine. So Jesus says this is serious business, and yet there is a grace for Peter who denies Jesus three times that overwhelms. And so there's going to be good news in just a moment that comes with this hard news about we're all people with regrets. Some of them are quite serious. And I think you can see the good news in a certain sense just in the way when you look at your Bible and you look at the way that John the Gospel writer lays out this story of Peter's denial. He gives us the account of the denial and then he shows us Jesus inside being questioned getting slapped in the face, suffering, and then the other denials. And I wonder if that's not visually a picture of all of our regrets and denials too, that God always stays in the center of it, suffering for our sake. That there's Jesus right in the middle. He's being questioned and he denies nothing. There's Peter outside while Jesus is inside. He's being questioned and he denies everything. But Jesus in the middle is our hope. Jesus suffering unjustly for us is our hope. He's suffering as he stands before um, Annas, the high priest. Now, he really wasn't the high priest. He just had been the high priest. Let's go to that next slide. Um, Annas the high priest was the high priest from uh, AD 6 to, 6 to 15, historians tell us. So this is, you know, this is a decade or more later um, in terms of the timeline. 
and Caiaphas, his son, son son-in-law, was now the high priest. But this is a family system, historians tell us, especially Josephus, that was corrupt, that they were in the high priestly role, but they were looking to gain wealth, and under their rule, that is Annas and his son-in-law Caiaphas, and then five other sons who also served as high priest. You say, like, what's going on here? This seems like it's a rigged system that they got going. Um, Jesus dies. Stephen, the first martyr, dies. And Jesus' brother James, who later became bishop of Jerusalem, also is killed. And so when Jesus is standing here in the middle of the night before Annas, who's not even the high priest, but he used to be, so it seems like he still has power and influence, otherwise why bring Jesus there? Um, He's in a dangerous position. He's in a dangerous position, and he's there for your sake, and he's there for mine, and he's there for Peter. Jesus is in this spot. Um, Caiaphas, the son-in-law, says something that's rather remarkable. It's condemning for Jesus, but when we look back and read it, it's hopeful for us. Caiaphas, the son-in-law, who actually was the high priest, he says, um, and it's been come to be known as the Caiaphas prophecy, he says the best thing is for one person to die in the place for all the people. And when you look at that through a, a resurrection lens, you see Jesus died for all the people. He was saying, it's better to get rid of this one guy than to have problems with all these other people. You say, well, that's the Christian story. God saying that one would die in the place of many, that all God's punishment for all of our sins and betrayals and regrets and Peter's denials and yours and mine too, that the, the payment and the price for all those things, they'd be pressed on Jesus, that one would die for the sake of many. And so God uses the high priest here who seems to be part of a corrupt family system to speak a word of prophecy that later would be fulfilled in a way that allows us to celebrate Easter again this year. And so when we look into the text, we see even the way it's laid out, that God has hope for us. We see Jesus suffering in the middle of it, which is the season of the year where we're paying attention to his suffering for us. And we see God using... um, an unexpected person to prophesy about God's great plan coming to fulfillment. And so what do we do? We stop, we look at the text, we see what God has to say for us, and then we listen. We listen to God's Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts, and I encourage you to listen right now. to simply pray a silent prayer that says, God, may your Holy Spirit draw me to your word that you have for me today. Draw me and my attention or my focus or my wondering or my pondering to exactly where you want it today because I know you can and I know because you love me, you do. And so may my heart, Lord, hear what it is that you would have me to hear. Listen to your spirit's prompting or drawing or nudging or prodding or pulling. Oftentimes we have to test those things. We say, is that God speaking to me in my mind, in my spirit, or is it something else? We confirm it. That's why we're in a community. So we don't sit at home by ourselves and say, the Lord said to me, no. We hear something from God filtered through his word, the the ancient truth of all the ages, and we say to someone else, huh, I think God might be telling me this, and then they help us. We help one another to see. That's the beauty of the community. You say, nope, that doesn't fit with anything else that God has said, so maybe we need to look at this from a different angle, or that sounds exactly like what Jesus would say. And you better follow what he's calling you to do. And so that's our last thing this morning, is to respond. 
how do we respond? Once we've stopped, we've looked at the Word, we've listened for the Spirit's leading, what's our response? And the response could be one of a million things, but here are a couple ways that I'd suggest you could respond to this particular text. The first thing is to thank God for His forgiveness. Thank God with someone like Peter who... Um, denied Jesus and was forgiven, that that same God hears our denials or our betrayals or our regrets, and he continues to offer his grace and mercy and forgiveness. In 1 John, he puts it this way, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He doesn't put a caveat on it or a condition or an if-then clause. He just says, if you confess, God forgives because that's who he is. Because Jesus suffered, because he was before the high priest, and the official slaps him in the face, and then he's before the next one, and the next one, and he suffers a scourge, and whips on his back, and finally nails in his hands and his feet, and the weight of the burden of sin of all the world placed upon him. God forgives because Jesus suffered in our place. And so simply confess your sins to him, and he'll be faithful and just to forgive. Thank him for his forgiveness. And then get back on mission. Now, this isn't in our text, but it's in the story of Peter. Peter, Jesus' lead disciple, in the moment that is critical, thinks, I don't want to get arrested. I don't want to die. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. And when they're asked, do you know him? He says, I don't know him. And they said, Is, aren't you a friend of his? No, I'm not. Weren't you there when he was arrested? I wasn't. This same Peter Jesus comes to later, after he's crucified, after he's placed in the tomb, after the stones rolled away, after he's resurrected from the dead, he appears to his disciples, and he appears particularly to Peter, after he makes them breakfast on the beach at the Sea of Galilee, and he asks Peter a question. He says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, I do. It's not on the screen in front of you, but he asks him a second time. He says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, you know I do. You know I do. And then a third time. Do you think Jesus, the master teacher, knows what he's doing here? How many times did Peter deny him? Ask him a third time, and Peter finally just says, you know, Lord, you know my heart. And Jesus did. And he put him back on the mission that he had originally called him to. And he says, feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. He says, Love them as I have loved you. Forgive them as I have forgiven you. Care for them as I have cared for you. Three times. Thanks be to God that, that he doesn't just give us good news once because I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes God's message for me has to come not once, but twice, but three times. It seems like sometimes more than that. He has to speak to me through his word, through circumstances, through my family or friends, through a conversation, through coincidences, you know, coincidences. Um, he makes sure I know what he's saying, even if I'm not quick to learn it or can easily absorb it. And with Peter, God says, Peter, it's time to get back on the mission I called you to. So feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, Feed my sheep. Three times Jesus comes. And so thank God for the forgiveness that he provides for us. Get back on mission and then stand up for Jesus when you have a chance to stand up for him. Stand up for him when somebody at work says, how was your weekend? No, oh, my weekend was great. I watched a lot of basketball. I went to this. I went to church on Sunday reminded of God's good news? Or if someone says, are you a Christian? Say, yes, I am by God's grace. I'm broken. I'm fallible. I'm sinful. I have regrets, but I'm a follower of Jesus. Thanks be to God. He's changed my life. 
I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. Stand up for Jesus whenever you have a chance. Because Jesus says, if you acknowledge me before others, I will acknowledge you before the throne in heaven. So stand up for Jesus and follow him. Peter was given this great second chance. And the good news is God has another chance for you too. Another chance for you too. So his invitation stands to continue to come to him, especially in this season of Lent, draw close to him through his word. Um, you can look at those scripture passages. They're all listed there for this week. But take a step in God's direction because he's there waiting for you with open arms. Let's pray to him together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your good news that comes to us in the middle of our regrets and our sorrows and sometimes our foolishness. The good news that your son suffered for people just like us, not just your ancient people long ago, like Peter, but for people just like us today and all those in between. Jesus, we thank you for paying such a great price. We thank you for being in our place on the cross. We thank you for um, dying and rising so that when we die, we will rise with you. We thank you for the promise of life now, life abundant, life with you. Open our eyes and open our hearts. Fill us with your spirit that we might follow you and continue to speak to us from your holy word. Lord, that we might hear your voice loud and clear today, tomorrow, and the next. Lord, we're forgiven because you were forsaken, because your amazing love came down from heaven and lived among us. And Lord Jesus, today we thank you for loving your disciple Peter and for restoring him. We thank you for loving us. May your great love and mercy and grace restore us today. We ask this in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen.
When you walked in today, you came into a place of prayer, and today there are several ways that um, you can join your hearts in prayer. In your bulletin, if you have a prayer request today, there's a place that you could fill out a form and hand that in, and there are people who will pray for that today um, and throughout this week. Um, you can also um, come forward here in the sanctuary at the conclusion of the worship time or go to the prayer corner in the ark, and um, someone will be there ready to pray with you as well. Um, or if you're online or if you're here in person, you can send a prayer request to prayer at heritagecrc.net. Um, our goal is to be a place of prayer, a place of God's word, and a place of his hope and grace and mercy. So as you head into this week, go with his word a blessing upon you. May the Lord your God bless you, keep you, and cause his face to shine brightly upon you. May he turn toward you and be gracious to you, and may his Holy Spirit fill you now with his power, his presence, and his peace. And all God's people say, Amen. Go in peace.